Welcome to episode 283 of the Flying Free Podcast. Today, we are going to be talking with Dan Koch. Dan is a licensed therapist in the state of Washington. He's the host of the You Have Permission podcast and a spiritual abuse researcher who has developed the spiritual harm and abuse scale currently in use by religious trauma clinicians around the world. And I'm excited to know about that tool and to even talk about it today with Dan. So welcome, Dan, to the Fine Free Podcast. Natalie, thank you for having me. We should also say that in some number of months, you will be joining me on You Have Permission. So this is part one of a two-part conversation. And I love that. I always say, you know, people who listen to pod, if they're listening to my podcast, then they obviously like podcasts. So if I have someone who's a host of a podcast, it's such an easy sell to say, try this podcast. If you like this interview, then you're probably going to like that other podcast. And listeners, if you're thinking 280s, wow, she must really know her stuff. I don't want to listen to any podcast that has fewer than 200 episodes. <laughs> I want them to get their 10,000 hours. We're at 259. So, wow. Okay. We're getting, we're just, uh, we're like six months behind you or so. Okay. Yeah. Well, and you and I know that this is hard work to stay consistent and consistently put out a show week after yeah. week, after week, for year after year, after year. I think that's something to be proud of. So congratulations well, to you for getting this far. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate yeah. it. I, I tell people mostly like, I can't help it. Like it is mostly <laughs> a thing that I would do anyway. Like uh, I heard a phrase, and this is not me speaking from a psychological lens because because I'm just repeating it, but healthy narcissism. And I think, oh, that's about right. I've got just enough to think that people could still be helped by my ideas for 259 You episodes. Ha You have to. Yeah, Otherwise, have to. who would put yeah. out their work in the world if you yeah. don't think that it's of any value? Yeah. So, oh. well, I took your screener. So you developed, and we're going to talk about this. Yeah. Uh, you, you developed this um, spiritual uh, harm and abuse scale. It's a clinical screener that people can use. Yeah. And I took it. And I just want to talk about that for, well, we're going to really kind of spend the whole podcast talking about it, but I scored, I scored in the high abuse category overall. And of the six categories that we, we will go into in a little bit that you yeah. analyze and measure in your tool. I scored high in four of them and medium in two of them. And my longtime listeners who have read my newest book, which is All the Scary Little Gods, they now know why and how I scored this high on this scale. But I was really yeah. gratified to see that there's actually an objective tool that people can take to measure spiritual harm and abuse. And I think the time in our, where we're at in the world today is ripe for such a tool to exist and be used. So I just want to thank you, first of all, for creating it. You're very welcome. There is another one that some people use called the Spiritual Abuse Questionnaire, uh, developed okay. by Dr. Keller uh, in Texas. Um, so both can be good. Uh, How does I it compare? I, uh, like hers is a little bit shorter. Um there's some like nerdy statistical stuff that I, I think makes mine slightly preferable, but it's not, it isn't like a huge difference. If someone told me, Hey, my therapist had me take Dr. Keller's, you know, scale to talk about it in therapy. I'd be like, fantastic. I'm glad you did that. Okay. Well, yeah. we're not going to talk about that scale. We're going to talk no, about yours no, here. No. Uh, this episode brought to you by Pepsi, not Coke. <laughs> <laughs> right. Emphatically. Oh <laughs> I guess it should be Coke, not Pepsi, given my last name. Oh, well. <laughs> right. So his last name, just so people know, his last name is spelled K-O-C-H. Like the evil billionaires. Yeah. Well, and I didn't even know that, but I grew up with, I was telling him before we got started, I grew up with a, it, there was a family in our church that had that last name, but they pronounced it Cook. So yeah. we had to do it. And the guy's take. name was Don. You had a Don Cook. Yeah, Don and Cook. now you're and talking to Dan, Dan I think. Cook. I think Don Cook is my evil step uncle or something like that. <laughs> he was a, a good guy though, actually. Okay. So he was good. And it wasn't okay. just, you know how some churches there's families, there's like the mom and the dad go and then their kids grow up and then they have kids and then they have grandkids. Yeah. It was one of those families. It was legacy like a legacy church family families. in the yeah. church. Oh yeah. Yeah. That those. was the cooks. Yeah. Those families, you know, actually that that's kind of maybe an interesting way in. So, and if you don't want to get quite into it yet, that's fine. But one of the, subtypes of spiritual abuse that the scale measures uh, is called maintaining the system. 
Mm. How did you let's did you go medium or high on maintaining the system? Let's try. High. High. Okay. I was high. Yep. So maintaining the system is is you know I tried to name these things in a way that are pretty straightforward. So maintaining the system, both leadership and group members tend to act in ways that maintain the status quo, which can take many forms: victim blaming, shunning, protecting leaders from consequences, social isolation, and more. That's the little thumbnail description. But what's interesting is that as opposed to controlling leadership, which is another one of the types that I think people most commonly associate with the idea of spiritual abuse, the maintaining the system is often done by the foot soldiers. Yes. And, and not even foot soldiers is maybe even the wrong term because that implies orders from on high. But, right. That they that they're aware of and they're consciously exactly. doing it. Yeah. That they are like doing the leader's bidding. But that's actually not how a lot of religious groups, churches work. They they don't act like I think about the church I grew up in. My parents went there for 30 years. And during that time, they saw five senior pastors. How much, you know, churn was there on the elder board? Probably 40 or 50 elders came and went. So it's like the families, these legacy families often have significantly more power than even the head pastor has, depending, of course, on the it's obviously church to church. Uh, and those families, when those families are healthy and supportive, oh, my goodness. I mean, I, my I'm still close with a number of those families from my upbringing that my were my parents friends. Yeah. Right? And they are now in their 70s and I, I'm still friends with them and want them in my life and in my kids lives and stuff and if those families are unhealthy if they've got if they haven't worked through their stuff then you know they can actually do more harm than a pastor in, in some circumstances and that's something that i actually don't know that i would have i don't know that i would have assumed that before doing the research uh, mm. to develop the scale that's interesting. Yeah. This family that I was referring to, they were actually healthy. And I think, and I actually think the church, it's interesting because I scored high on this, but it was mostly my, ch my church growing up. I was mostly pretty healthy church. It was my family that was a little dysfunctional. And then I took what I learned from my family and then got into two churches as an adult, one as a young adult and one as an older adult that were both very dysfunctional in different ways. There's so mm. many flavors. It's so fascinating. There's like a few ways to get it right and a lot of ways to get it wrong, maybe. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's why I just ended up, you know, scoring high. But so why, what inspired you to research this topic? I initially wanted to do so. So it started as my doctoral dissertation, um, but it, we actually got it published uh, in the journal for the scientific study of religion. Uh, I have not finished my dissertation yet, okay. and this is already published. So I have a little bit more work to do, um, basically like dotting some I's and crossing some T's to okay. sort of finish the dissertation. Um, but basically, I wanted to initially do something on the topic of end times teachings and like anxiety and other mental health stuff, because that is my own story. That's my primary religious trauma, okay. uh, almost the only one in my life. Well, it depends on how how loosely you want to find it. Certainly the strongest. And I started getting into, you know, the the scholarly research on it. And what I found was there's there's no framework for me to sort of add something on that topic because the sort of umbrella topics under which that would nest have not been explored enough yet by themselves. You know, there was at the time uh, only the one spiritual abuse questionnaire, which was part of a dissertation and not peer reviewed. No offense to Dr. Keller. I do think it's quite good. And there is no agreed upon definition, very little prevalence uh, data about this stuff. And so my advisor encouraged me. She's like, I think you should develop a scale. And she had some practice with that. She had some experience from previous uh, research that she had done. So she was able to kind of help me in the way that a dissertation advisor normally helps. And so that's what led me to it was, was thinking about, you know, rapture stories and uh, the left behind books and that whole, you know, panoply of interesting uh in in my view very interesting teachings that have like just so little basis in reality 
um, that that actually kind of got my curiosity going. How were people so into this when like literally every single end times prediction has been wrong? Like by <laughs> definition, they've all been wrong. It's the beginning of time. Since yeah. the beginning of time, everyone who has said that they know the day or the hour or the week or the year or the month or whatever, they've all been wrong. Yeah. And there even are only are very few other predictions that are short of this is when Jesus will return that are even could be considered right. The big one is the forming of the nation of Israel in the 40s, which Darby got right, you know, I don't know, 75 years prior. But he was really uh, he was already involved in the Zionist movement at that point. It was like a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Anyway, the. I'm getting on a tangent because I tend to do that. So I'll just pull back from the cliff. Well, you know what? I, I you're speaking my language because that's what my mom, my mom was into dispensationalism. Yeah. And she wasn't just into it for herself. She like wanted to indoctrinate everybody into it. So when I say like my church really wasn't into that, but my mom was, yeah. and my mom was a zealot for expressing that and having us, her daughters read books about it and, um, you know, buying into that. That's all. So when you grow up with, that's the only thing you ever know. You just mm -hmm. think, like, I remember growing up and, and finally becoming an adult and realizing, or yeah, I actually as a teenager, I started asking questions, you know, and pushing back a little bit. Cause some things just didn't make sense. And then of course it, that's when it, you know, got it cross the line over into abuse because when you can't, aren't allowed to ask questions or when you're told that you're being rebellious or you're not being a godly person because you have questions um, that can't be answered by the way, then now we're getting into emotional abuse and control and just the whole nine yards. So yeah. anyway, um, yeah, very wackadoo. And my mom is still, uh, my mom hasn't talked to me for five years, but she's still is very, you know, she wants her grandkids to believe in this. She's like in her, she's going to be 80 this year. And she's still on that, on that trajectory. And I think it's all been debunked. I mean, does anyone even believe that stuff anymore? Like the whole oh, yeah. dispensational thing? Oh yeah. Still. Are there churches still the, that still do that? Oh yeah. If you look at, you know, the statements of faith on websites of any number of churches that are labeled like Bible church or Baptist churches a lot of times. Like, I, I think that's still the, I could be wrong on this, but I think that's still what's taught at like Dallas Theological Seminary, possibly oh. Southern Baptist um, Seminary. There's like an official one. Uh, I think that's the name of it. So it's, it's still big in conservative Christian okay. circles. Yeah. And uh, I, I've looked at faith statements that are like, you know, yeah, we expect any day now the visible bodily return of Christ in the sky. And, you know, yeah, it's yeah. it's it's still around. I think it's obviously less popular than it was in from, you know, 1971, I believe, is late great planet Earth when that book is published and then left behind is really exploding in the mid 90s. Mm -hmm. So it's less popular than that kind of 30 year span. but still pretty big in that world. Yeah. It's crazy. I there's oh. a term that I that I have found so helpful around this stuff. Okay. By the way, which is plausibility structures. And I started I came across it at some point when I was trying to understand yeah, you know, 2016 and the uh you know, inordinate support for Donald Trump in, in my the community that I was raised in. And plausibility structures is, is the idea that like the more people around you that believe something, the people that you regularly interact with, then the more easy it is for you to believe that thing. And yeah. that is kind of independent of evidence, independent of truth or falsity. It's just like if you are raised into a jihadist, you know, suicide cult, then for a while you are going to assume that that's that that view of the world is correct. You have to get to a certain age. You have to actually start meeting people or reading people that disagree because yes. until then it's like, well, yeah, we all right. I mean, obviously Allah hates the great white Satan, you know, like we right, all know right. that everybody I know believes that. And 
And so that gets into really interesting stuff with the internet and the age of information and differences between Gen Z and boomers and all that stuff because our parents were able to be in much more sealed environments in terms of information yes. than even we were. And then my kids just have, now they're going to have, by the time my kids are learning to use computers, they're, they're four and five months, you know, who like chat GPT will just like give them any answer that they want in a digestible form or something like that. Um, they don't even have to scour Wikipedia like I've had yeah. to do, you know, it's, so it's, that stuff is is very interesting, and again, there's another classic patented Dan Coke tangent. So well, people are really I getting a that. sense. I people are getting a sense trails. for how I podcast. Yeah, rabbit trail. Yeah, That's rabbit cool. trails. And um, my I've been writing and doing this for a long time, and people who have been following me for a long time know it's like, oh, Natalie's doing another rabbit trail. So I love that that you do that too. That's it's a thing. Well, you gotta if you're gonna get into the two hundreds of episodes, you know, you gotta have ways <laughs> to fill time. You can't, it's not like you just have six questions for every Clear. guest. That's exactly. not going to be so boring. Reps. No. Yeah. We got to explore those, those little gullies and holes. Okay. So I want to say something too. I, I, there's part of me that's like, don't say it because you know, you'll lose listeners, but I'm, I, I'm not about trying to keep listeners anyway. I just, you know, need to speak. This is, this podcast is for whoever likes it. And if this makes you not like it, then bye. But when I think about the left behind books and you know how they, um, so I used to, I, I read some of them back in my, in my day Same. and there was always, there was that political leader. If I'm remembering correctly, there's a political re leader that rises to power and he's like, not a good person, but he, he makes people believe he's a good person. He's like, mm -hmm. He sort of, uh, did you read any of those books? Are you referring to the antichrist? <laughs> Nikolai yeah, Carpathia? Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 But like, he's a president. I think he's the president. No, he becomes. So here's what's so implausible about it. He becomes secretary general of the UN, which all of a okay. sudden has like a global army at its command. Whereas the current UN can barely even get peacekeeping troops <laughs> during famines. I mean, it, it's, it is an absolute conservative fever dream geopolitically. <laughs> that like this would happen. And then all of a sudden the whole world would be like, how about just electing one UN leader to rule us all? It is the, it is the least plausible. I mean, just imagine, I, I suppose this is probably back when the European union, um, maybe it felt like the trajectory there was towards sort of increasing consolidation and, and decreasing national identity. Obviously now 30 years after it left behind, we see how much trouble the European Union has had, even keeping European countries united, yeah. much less giving them one supreme military leader, much less including Africa and South America and China. And, oh, North Korea is going to be like, all right, UN, here, right. We'll get, here are our nukes. You know, like, of course right. not. But that is, yes, that's the way it's presented in the books. Um, and, and that's partly because evangelicalism, evangelicalism in America tends to be more isolationist and very skeptical of globalism uh, yeah. and you know skeptical of, of those kinds of things so well i was always i grew up just learning that the one world order and yeah was that's that's uh that's a totally satanic thing and so anything that it's also right around the bend yeah yeah so anyway i just what I remember is that guy, maybe it was, maybe I watched one of the movies, I think, cause I'm picturing that person in a room and then he kind of just gets everyone. It's like he brainwashes everyone into thinking yeah. one thing, even though there's another thing going on. Yeah. He's, I mean, he has like, in that view, he has like the devil's power or something. Yeah. Yeah. Something well, like that. Well, then I've just been thinking why, like I talked to my husband and some other friends of mine that are Christians and we're just like, we don't understand. It's hard for us to understand how Christians follow this guy who is in trouble with the law all the time. Mm -hmm. He rapes people. He cheats. He steals. He's like one of the most immoral human beings on yeah. the planet. He's a flaming, obvious narcissist. And yet so, and yet Christians are following it. And the, and the only thing I can think is like they're brainwashed and they had, and the, the left behind books, 
even gave them a hint that this guy was coming. And, and the only ones that are brainwashed are actually them. The ones that got the hint. I'm being facetious here, but it's just, no, I, know. I just can't wrap my brain around it. I have felt the pull of such theories myself. I, I think that in my better moments, I am more apt to consider it to be, you know, a combination of 10 plus factors over many decades that uh, really formed, you know, white evangelicalism in America and led us to eventually a place like this where a conservative sociopolitical identity would trump, no pun intended, all, you know, all other forms of sort of uh, spiritual commitments. Yeah. And in fact, that an appetite would grow for precisely the kind of leader that the Bible denigrates. Right. Yeah. But you, uh, you don't, <laughs> the thing is like, well, there's, we go a lot of ways with this. I'll, I'll just end it there and see what you, how you'd like to respond. Well, my brain was just going, Oh, what are those 10 things? 10 plus things. I like, can go off the top of my head. I, you know, I've interviewed people about this on You Have Permission. I, I started covering it in 2016. I, I used to have a okay. show called Depolarize. Um, and I, I ended up stopping that show because for me, it's not healthy to have to stay abreast of political news. Oh, I figured I totally out that that agree. was just not good for my nervous system, yeah, not good for yeah. my life, my family, my marriage. So I, I stopped doing it, but I, I still will talk to people sometimes and have them as a guest who are in that world. So there, there's like a, yeah, off the top of my head, there are parallel institutions. So this is a really big thing in evangelicalism that really got going with the, with the founding of the contemporary Christian music scene starting in the 80s. But then it, of course, it goes to films and television shows and children's curriculum and the homeschooling world and all the magazines, all your Brio and Boys Worlds and, mm -hmm. and all this stuff all the focus on the family stuff basically by the time i'm born in 1983 you if you want to you can raise your evangelical children in an entirely parallel institutional universe to yeah. your neighbor kids so for instance i could wake up and uh i mean even to the point of they probably made christian breakfast cereal at some point <laughs> but after breakfast you know we read a devotion uh, and we, you know, if you read a book in the morning, it's a Christian book. Uh, my parents take me to my Christian school where we are, we have curriculum from Christian curriculum writers. When it's family movie night, we watch a Christian movie. Um, you know, the list goes on and on and on. My, my parents might only read Christian books. I'm only allowed to listen to Christian music and you get all the way down there. And those institutions, so basically they set up. Uh, an entire segment of the population at its most at one point, maybe 50 million Americans to be able to live in their own entire world. And as a result, to distrust mainstream institutions. Yes. So how hard is it for someone who's lived like that their whole life? How hard is it to believe that the New York Times and CNN are colluding to yes. denigrate a Republican godly president? It's very yep. easy to believe that. Because yep. you've literally spent 30 years believing something very close to that. Exactly. You've been programmed. Okay. I'm so curious now about your family because my old, my oldest son is 30 and he was born in 1993. So you're, you know, you're not even quite a decade older than him. Yeah. I'm but 40. did your parents ever come out of that? Or, Cause I raised my, I raised my older kids. They were all raised in the same thing. I was like your parents probably. Until yeah, I, I mean, broke out. I, that was a little bit of a fictionalized version of, of my parents. I, oh, I okay. had it easier. I, I call it I was like a California evangelical. OK, so my dad was a marriage. We would have judged therapist. you. Yeah, sure. So my dad was a marriage family therapist and okay. that inoculated him against most of the of the true silliness. Nice. Um, he, he he had to grow and, and change in, in some ways. But like, for instance, my favorite memory is when I was in my evangelical high school and I was applying to colleges and our school counselor told me that she didn't think I should apply in psychology because she only believed in biblical counseling. And she had gone to Point Loma University, a Nazarene school in San Diego. And my dad wrote her a letter 
And she read it and she called me in and said, I'd like to apologize. <laughs> wow. So he, I mean, he took her to school. He's like, you have no idea what you're talking about. I've been a married, you know, I've been a marriage family therapist for 20 years. Here's what I know. Here's what the science says. So I, I did have that kind of a buffer. And my mom's a little bit of a rebel. She always told jokes with swear words in them. She always had plenty of non-Christian friends. So they they buffered us a bit, my brother and I, from the kind of true parallel institutions. But I had friends just down the street. I had a friend four doors down that was only allowed to play the Bible version of Sega Genesis, you know, oh uh, but I was allowed to listen to secular music and stuff like that. So I didn't have it so bad myself, but okay. I, I I've known enough people and I've interviewed enough people that I could sort of present that, you know, that example. Yeah. Okay. So interesting. So then did you, you must have, it, it sounded like at the beginning you did experience spiritual abuse and you know what yeah. that is. So what was, what was that all about? Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So, so the background is that I already had panic disorder before I encountered any end times teachings. When I was in third grade, I had a series of panic attacks about thunder, not lightning, which is odd because lightning can actually kill you. Thunder can't do anything. Right. Uh, but I was in third grade and I didn't know any better. And so I, I had a proclivity to panic attacks and that's in my family. My mom struggled with that when I was born. Her dad likely struggled with that throughout his life. There are stories that match that pretty well. He wasn't diagnosed while he was living, but probably he had panic attacks. And so when I was in sixth grade, Someone gave me a book and I, man, I've not been able to track this down. Unfortunately, it, it must have been self-published. It was a riff on a famous pamphlet that sold millions of copies in 1988 called 88 Reasons Why Christ Will Return in 1988 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This one was for, it would have been 1994. And the book, the little book said that Jesus would be returning in September of 1994. I was given this book by some adult in my uh, Christian sixth grade school. And they thought it was good for me to have it for some reason. And I read in April of 1994 that essentially my life was going to end that September. Uh, oh. And that threw me into a series of panic attacks and, you know, just, just tremendously developmentally inappropriate uh, for that age. Like what the hell was I supposed to do with that anyway? Yeah. What is a what is an eleven year old going to do differently with this information? Yeah, is a question that this person did not ask themselves. Yeah, and so that and then that ended up being kind of the main panic attack trigger of my life. Uh, I don't really struggle with panic attacks anymore. I did though through my through about thirty or so, and by far that topic is the is the number one source of those panic attacks for me. I had to work through it and, and, you know, now I've come out the other side and helping other people with it, which is great, but uh, it was absolutely harrowing and yeah, sort of. What set did me your on. parents do? Did you tell your parents? You know, that's interesting. Uh, they don't remember me talking about it and it is possible that I didn't. It's possible because huh. they also don't remember me telling them about the, the third grade ones, the thunder panic attacks. Yeah. I, I think there's probably a mix of, they weren't on the lookout for that. And I was not particularly forthright about it. I, I imagine it's a bit of both. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're a little bit of an aloof family. Uh, okay. I think that the part of me that can sort of segment off a part of my brain to do 259 episodes of a podcast while also getting other stuff done, uh, you know, like we, we do a little bit of that naturally, so I don't really blame them for it. Uh, and and I don't think of them as being primarily about it. But my mom had the Left Behind books in the house and we read one or two of them kind of together and talked about them. It was just in the water. I mean, it was absolutely yeah. the monoculture of that subculture at that time. Yeah, yeah. As a parent, I can say I, my, my adult kids have come to me once in a while and they'll say, do you remember this? And it'll be something that I should remember you know, I really should remember and I should have addressed it. And I will just be like, I don't remember. Although I, I mean, I, I give myself a little bit of slack because I was in so much trauma myself, but yeah, I feel terrible. And I've had to apologize to them for just being out to lunch really on so many things. But, um, I think, you know, yeah. there's, 
it's it's tough. You you have what you have. You have the resources that you yeah. have. You have the time that you have. Uh, you have the capacities that you have. I mean, if I I think about right now, like my if my wife remembers anything from this period of adding a second kid, you know, the first let's say six to eight months of the second kid's life. I mean, her brain is Swiss cheese right now. It, it yeah. must be. It's got to be. Her yeah. sleep. Her sleep is so dysregulated. Yeah. You know, there there are real kind of there can be real biological reasons for some of this stuff. Yes. Oh, I totally agree. And we don't even really, I think now they're taught, we're talking about that, but I don't think back then you really talked about that. My daughter just had a baby last year. And then my son, his wife just had triplets last year. So there's four grandbabies and they're all just talking to them and watching them walk through that, just that nightmare of not getting any sleep. It is a, my daughter said it is a, I only have one baby and it is a real pain. Like it is, I am scared to death to have another child just because I don't know if I can survive. And, and she loves her baby. Yeah. She loves her child, but it's just so, it is so overwhelming for new parents. And I don't think, you know, we have to just yeah. give people credit. It's, I mean, it's tough. Like we, we only are surviving this because of, you know, three days a week of daycare for the older one. He's not in school yet. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a couple other sort of things that we sometimes utilize as help because I'm working full time and yeah. what, it's not, you know, it's like, it's, it just is. And yeah, we, you know, we live in a very expensive place. So I have to be, and I, I want to be anyway. I, I, um, I sort of have to work and I kind of have to make the podcast. That's kind of what I was saying earlier. It's a little bit of a compulsion. Yeah. And just trying to keep that a healthy, a healthy level of compliance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in your research, you identified six key factors or subscales of spiritual abuse. Why don't you tell, you kind of talked on, touched on one of them, uh, yeah, the maintaining, the, maintaining system. the system. Yeah. Yeah. Um, why don't you tell us about the other ones and how they manifest in abusive religious environments? Sure. Uh, so the first one is controlling leadership. And this is when pastors or leaders might be significantly exalted above parishioners or of, above lay people and considered to have sort of a direct line to God. And they also and or might have increased access and control over the daily lives and the minutia of their group members. So the distinction here is basically like there's a really common thing in, in therapy and psychological science where, especially counseling psych, when you are dealing with clients, you're often asking what is culturally normal for this person? And, and is something going on here that is beyond the cultural norm? So it is culturally normal in a religious group that the pastor has some authority that the other people in the group don't have. That's not what we're talking about. By merely having authority, that does not make it abusive. This kind of controlling leadership is when there is when that authority or control goes beyond the cultural norm, right? So, for instance, there are items like I was expected to consult my pastor or leader before making non-religious decisions. Now, you might opt to consult your leader. But if you are expected to consult your leader, then that's distinct, right? That is That tells me that there is an environment of control at the top. Yeah. What if you weren't, <clears throat> what if they didn't <clears throat> expect you, but it was like overtly, but it was an unspoken expectation? I think that's still expected. Yeah. I, it could be if you explicit didn't, then or you were implicit. rebellious. Yeah. It could be explicit or implicit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I think and then I, like. In another one here that's that's interesting is like being expected to follow my pastor's personal rules or advice around dating, marriage, and sex. Now, again, this is distinct from, well, we were really we were all really into purity culture. Well, yeah, we all were. And everybody was expected to be abstinent before marriage if they were in purity culture. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm saying it's like Pastor John has his own rubric and framework for how the young people will court or date or whatever and that's when we're getting into like he is he is exerting more control than the average pastor who might preach a sermon or give a talk 
about what he believes to be the biblical approach to dating, that's not necessarily spiritually abusive. Now, there is one of the things I will say, there's not a factor here. There's not a subtype for purity culture. And at the time that I was developing the scale, there was no peer-reviewed research that I could find on linking purity culture to spiritual abuse. Okay. I wish that I had sort of made that link myself. Uh, nobody had done that yet. And, and I didn't do it yet. If I ever redo this scale, I'm going to, I'm going to add in some stuff about purity culture because I think that that can be its own form of spiritual abuse. That doesn't necessarily come from a person, but comes from an ideology uh, and all of that stuff. Oh yeah. So yeah. I definitely think that could, that could be put in here. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, in my, in the first church, when I was a young adult and was dating, actually I wasn't dating. Cause that wasn't, that wasn't the thing, but our pastors did teach kind of from the pulpit, how they found their partners was kind of how they thought everyone, how God was doing it. They're like, this is how God does it. And it was, I wrote about this in my book, but the, the, the plan was that you would start a small group or work in partnership with a person of the opposite sex. So you got to know them through working with them and serving and doing ministry with them. Yeah. And then God would build a love and a camaraderie between you. And then you would, that, then you would get, you would court and then you'd get married. And that's how God would bring people together. So when I met my husband, we were both on staff with great commission ministries. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. I don't, I don't think, think so. they call it that anymore, but anyway, um, uh, we were both on staff working with college students and because that was the story that we were thinking and that needed to be right. We both just sort of followed along with it. And then a year later yeah. just did it. And I just thought this is, must be what God wants. There's a real problem in taking something anecdotal and turning it into a rule. Yeah. And this is why we do careful peer reviewed research because peer reviewed research separates out anecdote from rule. Hmm. And what I would say to that pastor is like, that sounds like a perfectly plausible way for a Christian couple to meet that there's right. nothing wrong with that. You meet, do it, my parents met doing young life ministry. Okay, great. The minute you turn it into a rule and an expectation that this is God's way, well, now you have crossed the Rubicon. You are going yeah. out over your skis and you are being over inclusive from one or a handful of examples, and you're putting God's stamp on that when people can meet in all fashion of ways. That's and, right. Yeah. And there's, you know, a little bit of that. I think there, and this is not something that I've studied. I've never seen anything written on this. If somebody knows of something, please email it to me. Uh, there is, there's something that I think is just natural. If you believe that God that the creator of the universe has called you to ministry, that you are just going to trust your own gut more. <laughs> you know, like, I think it's like at the most basic psychological level, if, if what I have done as an individual is responded yes to the God of the universe's call to do something, then of course I'm going to think, even if I can't admit it to myself overtly, that like, I'm more likely to know the truth. I'm closer to the source of the truth. <laughs> yeah. And it's just not true that being a good pastor, that having really good pastoral care skills, or even being a good speaker, a good synthesizer of information, right? A teacher, that is not the same thing as knowing true things about the world. It is, they are, there's maybe a little bit of overlap in like a common sense maybe is an overlap. But like, if I want to know the question of what is the healthiest way to have a Christian marriage, here's the thing. Natalie, people research that. Christians yeah. research that. Scientists do. And and there are things to find. Or you could go to the Gottmans here out of UW yes. in Seattle. There's really good data of, of tens of thousands of marriages about the kind of stuff that helps people stay together. Or... You can shoot from the hip and go with your gut because you're God's man. And that is just not as good of a way to get to something accurate. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, unfortunately that's, that's the way that people did that though. And that's the way people do that in the Christian world overall in general. I hate to speak about it. Sometimes I, I mean, I think people do that everywhere. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, You're right. I'm like, I try to be careful not to demonize evangelicals. Yeah. Like it's all, we all have the same brains. Yeah. So right. we're all going to make similar moves that meet similar needs. Like, you know, I know you talk a lot about internal family systems, which is not something that I'm officially trained in, but I've done a little bit of it with clients and I've done a little bit of training in it. And, you know, if, if I have different parts of my brain, then so do you. And so does everybody else. And, we're all, you know, like that rubric applies to every person, yeah. not just Christians, not just yeah. people we don't like, people who are not on our team. It applies to the people on our team as well. Yes, you're right. Okay. What is, what's another one? C controlling leadership, maintaining the system. Talk yeah, about here, embracing violence. I maybe. like embracing violence because this is the one uh, about, you know, my stuff about end time stuff. So embracing violence. These communities may see violence in many forms as a necessary part of God's plan for the world. They may lack concern about what's appropriate for children in terms of fear, and they may often employ terror and horror to motivate religious commitment or moral behavior. So this is oh, these are your hell houses. This yeah. is your showing a thief in the night to eight year olds. Uh, this is. Anything like explaining to very young children that the reason they need to become a Christian is so that they don't burn in hell for eternity. Um, there, There is an idea that it, also there's stuff like justifying uh, violence in the world, right? So rather than taking a default nonviolent approach and a default like maybe something like just war theory, which is very skeptical that most wars can actually be justified on moral grounds. This is more like a, hey, God is the John Wayne of human yeah. history, and God uses violence all the time. It's all over the Old Testament, especially New Testament, too. Ananias and Sapphira, they don't give the proper tithe. Zap. They're dead. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the God that we serve. And so we don't shy away from violence. And that leads to some of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think I answered. I think I was a little mistaken on some of my answers for that as I'm looking it over. Cause I, I, I scored medium, but as I'm looking at the questions again, I, I should have rated higher. If, like even terror or horror being used to motivate religious decisions. I gave myself a three, but I was, we watched the, uh, that movie, um, I, with the song. I wish we'd all been ready. I wrote about it in my book and now I can't even think of yeah, the name a thief of the in the night. Yeah, yeah Thief in the Night, night. Yeah. when I was a little small child mm -hmm. and I was absolutely, I had nightmares about that yeah. movie. Terrified. I still can vividly see scenes from that movie in my memory. And um, and everyone running, running away from these people who are chasing them and going to kill them because they didn't pray a prayer or whatever. And then because of my tremendous fear I was scared for all of my relatives and my friends. So I was telling them all about it, trying to get them to pray the prayer so that they wouldn't be left behind. So that I gave myself a three. I should have given myself a five for that. Yeah, that's uh the people don't know what the numbers mean, but they, they are. Uh, please indicate the extent to which you experienced this thing across your lifelong church or a religious group experience and never once or twice, sometimes often all the time. So basically you're saying that was all the time. It was. And even as a mother, even though I didn't have people telling me that it was already embedded in my brain. So yeah. even as a mom, my terror and my, my fervent prayers for the salvation of my children was, uh, was horrific, but my anxiety over whether or not my children would die and go to heaven or hell yeah. was um, over the top. That is what top. I think is the primary factor in, you know, teaching, but also kind of pressuring young children to accept Christ, you know, even before the, those same Christians would think that they are capable of sinning. Right. You know, they're below the age of accountability, quote unquote, which is of course not in the Bible. Um, I think that there's a lot of psychological pressure 
if you accept this worldview to ensure that your children and grandchildren don't go to hell. Yeah, that is the absolute worst thing that can happen. And so but since that is so anxiety producing in the individual, they will accept things that they would not otherwise accept to be able to check that box and calm down from that anxiety because it's unimaginable. I mean, I can't like the idea. If you think about it, if you want a real world comparison, it's the scene in Schindler's List where the child and the mother are separated at the concentration camps. I mean, it's yes. that but worse. Yes, okay? that's exactly so, it. So if that's possible and if you are told that like every single child born into this world uh, is by default going to hell unless they accept that atoning blood of Christ. I mean, just think of the pressure of that. Yeah. Well, and when your child starts to, when they go through normal childhood development, where yeah. they're a toddler, two, three years old and learning how to say no, mm -hmm. and then you're taught that that's, that's their sinful nature coming out and their rebelliousness yep. against the God of the universe. Yeah. It's like now, now you're trying to address something that's very normal and you're pathologizing it and addressing it also in a pathological way, even. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a quagmire. I do right. think I, 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 maybe we could go on one little rabbit trail for this yeah, one. Let's. Um, and you know, if people want to read about this stuff, it's all, you can, you can basically read everything I'm saying at dancokewords.com. There's a link and there's a free. Download. Wait, say that again. Dan Coke. Dan Coke words. Words .com. Okay. Yep. We'll put a link in the show notes. Yeah. So people can reference this. There's a, I have a research handout that sort of explains, uh, you know, what spiritual abuse is and all that stuff. So, uh, but if you go back in time, like prehistoric humanity, you think about the roughly, I mean, I don't know where your listeners fall on things like the age of the earth and, and evolution. Um, but I, my understanding is, is in the mainstream of, of scientific thought that genetically modern humans have been around for somewhere between 50 to 200,000 years, depending on where you want to draw the line. And we were very formed by that time. And if you if you think about living in a band of 150 hunter gatherers, you know, you are living in sort of constant terror of your children who are incredibly vulnerable to predators, to other groups of human, you know, bands of hunter gatherers, um, to the weather, right? Like we'd we evolved to be very aware of threats because that's how we survived. And what's so interesting about, for instance, the teachings of Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount, do not worry what you'll wear. Do not worry what you'll eat. Like Jesus is speaking directly to an ingrained terror that is hundreds of thousands of years old in our minds and saying, here's the great thing about religion and spirituality is that you can actually relax that anxiety. Mm. And we try to follow that in some ways, but we've, we've retained a spiritual version of that with heaven and hell. Yeah. So, okay. Maybe it's not true. Like, like my wife and I, other than in the first year of life, you know, everybody's worried about SIDS. Um, but other than that, we don't tend to think that our children are going to die. And yeah. that's true. They are probably not going to die anytime soon. The infant mortality is exceedingly low. You, you can still worry, yeah. but it's not like a, it's not an actual real life pressing concern for us. And yet we've got these anxiety centers in our brain that are ready to latch on to things. Mm -hmm. And so what do we do in some cases? Well, it's the eternal, it's the eternal stakes here because it's not the, this worldly stakes anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Why don't we talk about, um, the gender discrimination? Yeah. So this one's a little tricky. The way I describe it is, uh, usually women can be denied service or involvement opportunities or be discriminated against more broadly. Other types of discrimination also exist, um, but were not statistically viable to be put on uh, on the scale, but there's a, there are check boxes for them for the, for the screener. If you were, uh, let's see, it would definitely sexual orientation is one and race. 
Yeah. Okay. So you can imagine race, sexual orientation, or gender. Basically, you are being denied opportunities to participate in your community because of one of those things. So with women, it can be a little bit tricky because, again, there is a cultural norm for complementarianism in yeah. a lot of these worlds. It's true. And there, is, there are ways, there are better and worse ways of doing complementarianism. So I would not consider it spiritual abuse necessarily if a woman who wanted to preach was not allowed to preach in her Baptist church, her Southern Baptist church, because she would not expect that she would be allowed to. And so there's there's no like rug being pulled under you in that scenario. Now, is that good? No, I don't think so. I think that that woman should leave the Southern Baptist church and find a church where she can preach. Like that would be my right. advice. Right. But it's not necessarily spiritual abuse, but it is spiritual abuse, I think, or potentially spiritual abuse. If you go to a church and you are gay and the church uses a lot of language about how everybody is welcome and they sometimes talk about loving their LGBTQ neighbors and, you know, there's not a rainbow flag outside. You don't get this. You know, They're not like a part of the sort of liberal agenda, but lots of this inclusive language and you are a singer and at the end of one service you go i'm going to go i'm going to talk to the worship pastor and let's just say it's kind of obvious that you're gay visually mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. and the you, you go up and you ask the youth pastor like hey what's the volunteer process for getting on the praise team and you immediately see in his or her eyes uh yeah. what's going on and you are told um you know let me i'm going to have to talk to somebody about that and then eventually what you hear is that like you know we're not we don't accept this lifestyle and we, we can't have anybody on stage who is living a, uh, a queer lifestyle. So that is a situation where this is not made clear to you from the beginning. Right, right. You have started to invest in a spiritual community that uses a lot of language about openness and acceptance. And it turns out you're actually not accepted. You are a second class Christian in yep. this group. And what that's going to do is that's going to affect your ability to practice your faith. And the whole point for me about acknowledging and reducing spiritual abuse is to increase people's ability to practice their faith because I believe, and I think the research shows clearly, that religious involvement, spirituality are net positives for most people, for the average person. Mm. Uh, and it's it's not even close, really, um, especially when those people are intrinsically motivated to pursue their faith. And this example I'm giving is of a person who's willingly going to church, getting excited to get involved, wanting to offer their gifts and go up. This is a person who is motivated intrinsically. And that's yeah. where the research is clearest. Those people, for those people, religion and spirituality are, are just clear net positives in so many domains of their life. And now there is a check. Now there is a hurdle. And how's that going to affect this person's faith? How, what are they going to think about God, about Christ, about yeah. the church? Yeah. Well, that's, it's so tragic because the people that I work with are women that were in like myself, even very intrinsically motivated. And yet because of the things that I went through, I can't even go to church anymore without, yeah. you know, like after COVID COVID kind of gave me my out. And then, uh, and then it was like, I, I got used to it and realized, oh, God loves me, even if I don't go to church. And I just decided I just can't do it anymore. But right. um, it's not that I don't, it's not that I don't want to, it's that I just don't, I don't know. I just feel like it's not home anymore. It feels like a scary place to me now. And I think that's really that makes sense. <clears throat> makes yeah. a lot of sense to me. Okay. What about internal distress? Yeah. So those we've gotten through, those are the four types of spiritual abuse that the scale, that the statistical analysis of all the data brought forward and that, that I named and described. Um, <clears throat> and then there's two more scales, subscales that it measures. And these are internal responses to spiritually abusive experiences. Okay. So internal distress is, these are just the most common responses to spiritually abusive experiences depression, anxiety, self-image issues, social isolation, anger, lack of meaning, stuff like that. Yeah. So these are just in the in the peer-reviewed research that has done careful 
interviews and, and collected other data, survey data, interview data with people who have experienced spiritual abuse, we know that these are the types of things that show up. And they map pretty closely onto just the type of things that would like send someone to therapy in general. Yeah. So what that tells me is that spiritual abuse just reduces people's overall mental well-being. Yes. It's a good way of putting it. And then the last one, I scored high on that one, by the way, but the last one I scored medium on, cause I don't, my, it, it's harmful God image. My yeah. view of God actually got bigger when I got out of those yeah. kinds of environments. Mm -hmm. So it, it had the opposite effect on me, uh, interestingly enough, but why don't you talk about that? Yeah, this to me is one of the most interesting topics here. So one thing that the, that the statistical work uncovered was this cluster of symptoms that people tended to answer either yes or no together. And that's really what creates the subscales. And this one of harmful God image, the, the items here are, are about like God has become the villain in their story in some meaningful way. Yeah. Uh, like feeling that God has harmed me directly is one of the items here. And what's so interesting about this is that in basically every Christian understanding of God that you'd find in any denomination, any mainstream theology, God is not the villain. God, like we don't have a trickster God. This is not Zoroastrianism with one good God and one evil God, which has a lot of psychological you know, appeal to it. Well, maybe there are two forces in the world and one's good and one's bad. That's kind of a folk, uh, a folk spirituality that you see across the, the globe through time. That's not what Christianity says. Christianity says, no, 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 there's one God. God is totally good, totally loving, right? And that is very clearly expressed in essentially every form of Christianity. So the, for these people, their experience has disabused them of that idea to some degree yeah. that actually maybe God is not out for, for their goodness. And this is to me the most concerning effect of spiritual abuse, because if you can't trust God anymore, then you're not going to be able to do any of this stuff. Yeah. And you, and it's, it's almost, it is like a bizarro, like in comic books, the bizarro Superman, who's actually the evil Superman, not the good one who, who right. wants people to flourish. And this is something that shows up. It shows up in the research and uh, I've had some clients for whom this has been true. And it's it's really interesting. It's powerful. It's very destabilizing. Uh, in some ways, it's it's the worst possible outcome from a spiritual perspective. Oh, yeah. It's it's terrifying because it's some it's something that you trusted. It'd be like if you trusted someone and then they raped you. You just yeah. it's like such a core betrayal. And I've I've had friends who've gone through this even a son who experienced this, where it's just your, you, there's such a desolate, it's almost an existential problem. It's like, I maybe there, there either is a God and he's so horrible that I, and, and in that case, I don't even want to live or there's not a God at all. And all, and then what's the point? Like, what is the point of living? So I do think it puts you firmly into the realm of, you know, what existential psychotherapy focuses on, like these kind of core anxieties of the human experience and uh, and spirituality and religiosity are, you know, kind of protective factors against despair and depression that come from uh, those realities. And and this sometimes kind of pulls the blanket off and 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 then will force someone to reckon with those things without the primary coping mechanism that they had up until that point. Yeah. Yeah. Have you read Brian McLaren's book, Faith Beyond Doubt? I haven't read Faith Beyond Doubt. That's his, is that the new one? Um, well, I don't know. I or, think I read it a couple of years ago. Okay, I don't know. Maybe two ago or something like yeah. that. I've had him on the podcast, a uh, great conversation, but I don't, uh, my McLaren reading is, is from years ago. I, I devoured okay. his book, A New Kind of Christianity. Oh, I haven't read that one. Well, that, the Faith Beyond Doubt book was really, it was a lifesaver for me. Hmm. I I, lo I love that book. Highly recommend it. What'd you love um, about it? Huh? What'd you love about it? It, well, it, 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 I, I read it right after COVID. So, and I was going to a very dark place. I was almost like I was entertaining that thought. Maybe it's because everything was just dismantling. Yeah. And I thought maybe everything 
that I believed is wrong. Maybe there is, I did got, go there. Maybe there is yeah. no God. And when I would go, like allow myself to go into that dark hole, it was an endless abyss of despair and hopelessness. Like it was mm. so God awful. I don't, I would never want to relive that. And I don't know how I found, well, I started searching. I'm like, I need, I'm drowning. I'm suffocating. I'm dying here. I need something. And somehow I found that book and it just came at just the right time. And I, I just felt like God gave me that book. It, it, it walked through the stages. It walked you through the four stages of, of your spiritual development. And I could see all the stages, you know, the first one is just where it's just very black and white thinking. Are these Fowler's stages of faith development? Oh, I don't know. Probably that it's an old, it's an old paradigm, maybe from okay. the nineties or something like that. 80s okay. 90s, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I never heard of them before. And so yeah. he, he walks you through that, but the very last one is just, um, well, the middle one or the third one is where you go into this dark place of doubt, the dark, the dark night, of, night the of the soul. Yep. And, um, and then the last one is when you finally just accept that it's, you take parts of all four of this. I think I might've even done a podcast on this. Do you ever do that where you do a podcast, but you're not really sure and you can't uh, yes. remember. <laughs> <laughs> so what I was just saying to my daughter, count. cause she's the one who does the transcripts. I'm like, did we have to do a podcast about this before? <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, no, I, think, um, I will say about that. I think that approaches like that, where it's like transcend and include, like take your old faith and like go beyond it, but include the good parts of it. Yeah. And, you know, and like faith alongside doubt. My, my, my brief take from a psychological perspective is that that paradigm is very helpful for people who are sort of in the center or on the left side of kind of the personality spectrum, people who are open to new experiences, people who don't have sort of fundamentally conservative temperaments. I think it's less appealing to those people. Um, and, and, you know, those of us liberal, I, I consider myself a absolutely a, a sort of personality liberal. Like yeah. I, Give me every new food. I want to see every country. Uh, give me change and progress. Yeah. You know, as I get older, I, I'm I'm balancing that out with, I think, some common sense, more conservatism, small c conservatism, to to a more of a moderate place. Um, but as a person, I'm like, oh yeah, you want to go, you know, you want to go wine tasting in Cambodia? Like, who's paying for my flight? <laughs> um, I'm down for anything, you know. Uh, so. And people who are not that way, I think, are much less likely to go through all four stages of all these things. Like for them, that's not really what faith does for them. I'm glad that you found that and that you found it helpful. I find that stuff helpful, too. I just try to be careful not to, again, like we don't want to over generalize from not just you know, I talked about anecdote with your pastor. Yeah. But also we don't want to only look at one segment of the population at the yeah. type of people who listen to NPR and and read the New Yorker and say that those are all the types of spiritual people because it's not true. Um yeah. but it can it's it can be a very helpful paradigm. Yeah, that's so good. Cause I can tend to think, well, I, I am I am actually more cautious. Like if I get a new idea, I have to really think about it for a while before I, yeah. you know, if you were to say we should go to Cambodia and do wine tasting, I'd be like, Ooh, I don't know. That doesn't sound very safe. Is that like, is that okay? Are we going to be, you know, like, what does that involve? Okay. I'm not so, really so you're sure. closer to the middle, maybe in that kind of temperament yeah. personality way. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's why it took so many decades for me to get to where I was. I just sure. was, I just couldn't wrap my brain around that, but yeah. Um, but I love where I'm at right now in my faith. I feel like I finally just boiled it down to just, you know, I, I know this is so simple and cliche, but just love that, you know, God loves us. And if I want to be a God follower, then I'm going to love people. I'm going to love mm -hmm. starting with myself. I'm going to love and take care of Natalie. And then in doing that, I will be able to love and take care of the people around me. But, yeah. um, anyway, uh, Let's talk, let's close by talking about your podcast. Why don't you tell them what you talk about on your podcast? And then, um, I know people in my programs, they're all like the women are always sharing podcasts. So I know I've got a lot mm -hmm. of podcast lovers in my community. Yeah. So tell us about your podcast. He does say the F word, but sometimes I've we been tend, known we to, tend to bleep it in my articles we bleep once it. in a while. We bleep the F word. Or uh, Josh silences it or whatever, but oh, okay. I do, I do let him, I do kind of let it ride a little bit here and there. I would say 
if you think that you're on the left half of Natalie's listeners, then your permission may very well be for you. If you're on the right half, then you might dip in, but maybe expect to be a little scandalized or send it to your more liberal friends. There you go. Um, but, you know, I, I am very I, I attempt to be very respectful of conservatives, of conservative religion, the role that it plays. I, I engage with therapy clients for whom that is an important part of their life. And I don't want to disabuse them of that at all. Um, but my approach is uh, the way the log line is a show that that takes both Christianity and the modern world of science and culture very seriously. So I try and engage with scientific research in every episode. Um, I have a doctoral uh, education in psychology and counseling psychology. I'm a therapist uh, working towards getting that official doctor title in the next year and a half year or so. And I tend to, there tends to be some sort of scientific or at least cultural angle to every episode. Um, but it, it's a lot of like faith deconstruction stuff and, and different options and, and ways of engaging uh, the world, um, holding that tension between a life of faith and being open to information and knowledge from other sources uh, beyond spiritual sources. That's probably the best way of saying it. Okay. That sounds good. Do you, does one come to your mind, like an episode come to your mind that has been a big fan favorite? Yeah, there's two. Uh, the first one is, I believe it's episode six, five or six, something like that. And it's about a uh, queer affirmation. Okay. Um, and it's long, it's like two plus hours. And we really, we really dig in on sort of a biblical understanding and what's going on in the ancient world. And how do we think about this today? That's by far the most popular, I think mostly because that's the hottest topic. Still. Right. It's controversial. In, and yeah. yeah in American okay. Christianity, the other one, this is another, it's a personal favorite and a fan favorite. And it's easy to remember because it's episode number one, two, three, 123. Uh, and my friend Heather uh, Heather Griffin gives these this kind of framework. I'm trying to get her to eventually write a book about it. There isn't a book yet, so all you got is the episode. Okay. But she has a sort of a rubric of terms that she calls like the internal navigational system of evangelicalism, and it's it, it all starts with this idea that in that world, knowledge is easy. There are certain Bible facts that everybody knows who's willing to pay attention. And this leads to a bunch of other things that actually really explain abuse and abuse cover up. They expl it explains patriarchy. It explains um, a lot of the ways that that world will tend to interact with the outside world. And I just find it so helpful. And, and so many listeners have, it's a listener favorite as well. So episode 123, maybe you could put that one in the, in the show. Oh yeah. I can't, I'm going to go and listen to that one right away. Yeah. Yeah, that one's I fun. want to thank you so much. This was an amazing conversation. I I'm excited. It. I get to be on your show yeah. in a few we'll do the other couple way. months. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that'll be good. Um, so why don't you run, remind us again of where they can find you? Where are all the places they can find you? Yeah, I'm pretty active on Instagram now, uh, at Dan Coke. That one is phonetic D A N C O K E. Cause I couldn't get my real oh. name, unfortunately. Uh, I do a lot of videos there and sometimes we'll have podcast clips and I'll do, I'll do kind of informational stories and posts as well. And then you can listen to your permission anywhere you listen to podcasts. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thanks, Natalie.